Thank you for tuning in to the Be Blessed broadcast. Let's go into the service already in progress. Psalm 112 in the Amplified says, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God is the man or woman who fears the Lord with awe-inspired reverence and worships him with obedience who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light arises in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious and compassionate and righteous, upright and right standing with God. It is well with the man who's gracious and lends. He conducts his affairs with justice. He will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. He will not fear bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting, confidently relying on and believing in the Lord. His heart is upheld. He will not fear. While he looks with satisfaction on his adversaries, he has given freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor. The wicked will see it and be angered. He will gnash his teeth and melt away in despair and death. The desire of the wicked will perish and come to nothing. We're going to do one more scripture turn. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. And you'll be able to take your seats on this evening. Amen. Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6. This is the scripture that we use, parents, to make sure our children stay in line. This is what we say. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That is, accept their guidance and discipline as his representatives. Selah. See, this, this, this is for the kids we often use, but he also speaking to the parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That is, accept their guidance and discipline as his representatives. First point is, parents, you are his representatives. That even in, in their interactions with our children, we are still supposed to represent God. Let's continue to read. For this is right. For obedience teaches wisdom and self-discipline. Honor, esteem, value as precious. Children, honor, esteem, value as precious. Your father and mother. And be respectful to them. This is the first commandment with the promise so that it may be well with you and that you may have long life on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable, or humiliating, or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them. That was a mouthful. I'm going to read that again. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial, What's a trivial demand? Your kid having to ask you for something to eat. Your kid trying to say, I need new school clothes. Hey, I need new shoes because these have a few holes in them. Trivial. Or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive. unreasonable or humiliating or abusive nor by showing favoritism or indifference 
to any of them, but bring them up tenderly with love and kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You can take your seats as we hasten. I want to talk about some things because as an educator, it's my job to be honest. I can't get up here and lie to y'all and knowingly and intentionally give you a false truth and continue to allow you to run with it. So when we as parents, and I say we because I'm a youth leader, I can't just do y'all children as if they were mine. Even though a lot of y'all have said, Pastor Chris, if you need to hum them up, I ain't going to say nothing. Yeah, I appreciate that. But I believe that there's other ways to hem a kid up. Just like I was talking about that godly whooping on Sunday. How many of us have had a godly whooping? And that godly whooping got us right back to where we were supposed to be. And yet God never physically came down to physically beat any one of us. Which goes to tell me that we can be corrected. We can be fixed without having to be beat. I mean, if beating your children was a litmus or a prerequisite for successful children, black people would be ruling the world. I may have said that too quick. If beating our children was a prerequisite for successful black kids, then a lot more of us would be ruling the world. Because a lot of us got a lot of beatings. I got at least 12 of them. Okay? It's not a prerequisite. God, he literally just told us to not provoke our children to wrath. And a lot of times we have to understand that sometimes the words that we use, sometimes the things that we say is doing nothing but priming, programming, and grooming our children to be scared of us. Can I begin to break something down for us? If we understand that uh, Juneteenth finally, you know, freed the slaves, but we've only been raising free children for about 157 years. Put this into context. 157 years has been what we as black America has been raising children. That's not a long time. So you have a whole generation of ancestors who raised their children to be good slaves. Oh, I have to talk about it. Because we as black people sometimes carry these reverberations through our family line. When we begin to look at slavery, slaves were beaten when they did something they weren't supposed to do. You know, even something that we do with our children. You know how when somebody gives your kids a compliment, oh, Emmanuel is so well-mannered, and we could, you can have him. Oh, he's just putting on because you're here in front of y'all. He ain't like that all the time. Oh, they ain't all that. Have you noticed how it's so quick for us to just put our child down after someone lifts them up? Do you know this is a reverberation from slavery? Because our ancestors, when anyone would go to them and say, oh, this is a good looking boy, the fear of, you're about to separate me from my family. So I have to talk my child down so you don't go sell them tomorrow. When it goes to, oh, your daughter's so beautiful. Oh, she's just a baby. She makes so many mistakes. Because back then, regardless of age, your daughter was a sexual item. So if I have to talk her down to keep her, I'll do that every time. But you see, this is the problem because we carry these little effects down through the generations. And it's kind of like Apostle uses the analogy on Tracy of cutting the ends off the bread. We don't know why we cut the ends off. They just cut off. But our ancestors had to cut it off because it didn't fit in the pot. So, I, And we wonder why we do certain things because they have reverberations. 
So we have to begin to look at ourselves and raise our children with the godly heritage. This is what God says, be respectful to them. Be respectful to them. How many of our parents kind of talked down to us just a little bit? Not always rudely, but I did feel, I feel some type of way. Yeah. So my question is, why do we choose to do our children this way? We know how we felt when our parents told us to shut up. We know the feeling of being swatted in the mouth. We know the hurt and the pain of being sent to our room even though we had a big problem. But yet we continue for the people we love, the ones that God said, if we take care of them, we'll have a godly heritage. That's where we started off in Psalm 112. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. His children will be his heritage. So when we begin to look, I know you guys say, well, Pastor Chris, these kids, they get on my nerves. They wild, they unruly, and when I get off work, that's the last thing I feel like doing is trying to get the, come on, Joel, let's sit down. Let's not do, you see, this is because we associate this babying, coddling with gentle, respectful parenting. Has God ever babied you? Has our pastor ever babied any one of you? But yet we get the, we get the message. We get, we, get, we get the whooping. Let's go in our Bibles. I know I hear some of y'all in the spirit. Let's go to Proverbs 13 and 24. Proverbs 13 and 24. I hear some of y'all in the spirit. Let's go. Proverbs 13 and 24. The crown of the wise is their wealth of wisdom. But the foolishness of the closed-minded fools is nothing but folly. Let's go into the King James Version for me. Proverbs 13. Let's go back a chapter. That's a great one. That's for some of us fools in the Bible, in the body of Christ. But he that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chastens him. I hear y'all. I hear, let's go to Proverbs 22 and 6. Pastor, can you read this one for us? Proverbs 22 and 6. Proverbs 22 and 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he gets old, he will not depart from it. Okay, DJ, drop down to verse 15. 15, verse 15. Fool, <laughs> this is your scripture. <laughs> Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And then go Proverbs 23. We're going to start at verse 13 and we're going to stop at 15. Proverbs 23, 13. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and he shall deliver his soul from him. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Before you jump on this, before you, I, 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 know, I, I know where you're going with this, and I'm going to say this. I have a feeling Society now tells us that you can't beat your child. An open hand tap is all we get. That's it, that's all. And as Pastor Chris was talking about gentle parenting and being able to parent on a level that isn't so aggressive and so abusive, I just want to say I feel that there are some things that need to be re-researched. Yeah. 
because the talk is, as you all know, I'm in school, so the talk is don't beat your child. Beating your child will cause them for different things. It, it doesn't help them. It doesn't help build their self-esteem. It doesn't help them grow. It, look, I'm just saying... I'm not saying go get your extension cord and your chunkla and start chucking it. But what I am saying is we need to be firm because there are some parents who just don't. If my, and, and I laugh because Pastor Chris, I have this conversation with a few people and they're like, oh, I can't wait till you all have children. And I just had, I'm, I'm, I could wait, but I just had this conversation with Asia and I was telling her, what goes at home? My children are not going to go out in public and start acting crazy because they outside. That starts at home. So if I train my child at home to behave, by the time we go outside, they know to behave. When we come to church, if I treat my, tell my children at home, we don't put our feet in these particular couches. These particular couches are like the church. We sit up straight, we pay attention, and we listen to the word. We sit here, we sit up straight, we watch TV. Whatever so be it, when they get out and they go into the church, what happens? They come, they sit, and they listen to the word. We have to train our children in order to get them to understand what it means to be the upstanding child that they should be. Now, people see me and they're like, oh my goodness, she's really, you know, kind of hard on Grace. No, I'm not hard on Grace. I'm teaching Grace how to make sure when she gets older, she understands you can't just throw a fit because you didn't get what you wanted. I'm teaching Grace we need to learn when you're upset to communicate and then her mother will train her, not beat her, but train her, redirect her, and guide her by a little extra reinforcement. Because I feel like some parents just give up on the reinforcement part. Like Pastor says, you can't tell somebody to do something and then you have no follow through. Parents, that's a say lie right there. When you're training your child, you have to make sure you have follow through. You tell your child, I need you to do your homework. After you do your homework, I need you, then you can have your 10 minutes of TV time. Well, when you turn around and they on the TV, you didn't think to ask, did you do your homework? You didn't think to ask, well, what's just, you got to follow through. Okay, well, I see that you, did we do our homework? No, I didn't feel like doing it. So then why are we at this TV? This is training. You didn't have to whoop them. You didn't have to beat them. You went back and redirected them. And this is, I think, a part, Pastor Chris, where a lot of people feel they miss it because they don't train effectively. They don't follow through. They don't give the directive and then go back to make sure it was done. If my mother, Pastor Sean, would say, listen, this kitchen needs to be clean before you go to bed. Yeah, come on, come on, and if it's not, please understand, I will wake you up at 2 in the morning. I, I don't care that you have school in the morning. You're going to make sure that this kitchen is clean. I went to work. I cooked. I, I helped you out some with organizing the dishes, ran the water. The least I'm asking you to do is make sure they're clean. And me and my young ignorance, I ate, let the dishes sit in the sink. I said they're just going to get a pre-treat. That was my excuse. They're going to get a pre-treat. I'm letting all the extra stuff soak off the plates. And then it's late. I'm trying to do homework. I go to bed. And here rolls 2, 2.30 in the morning. Um, Miss Ma'am, didn't I tell you to clean the kitchen? Well, I'm tired. Well, so was I, but I still made dinner. So go ahead and go clean that kitchen. But Mom, I got school in the morning. Okay, you should have thought about that before you decided to skip over cleaning the kitchen. See, the conversations for me were different. Because when we made the arrangement, see, it was a matter of compromise. She saw what I wanted to do, which was play my video game or beyond whatever. And she made a compromise with me because she said, I want it done now and you want to play this now. Clearly, we both can't do the same thing. Both of our needs can't be met. But there's a way that we can both win. So this kitchen will be cleaned before you go to bed. Do you understand? Yes. 
do you understand that I'm up a lot later than you? Yes. So do you understand that if I go to check this kitchen at whatever time I choose, whether it be 2.30, 3 o'clock, 4 a.m., that if this kitchen is not cleaned, that I will come to your room and wake you up to clean the kitchen? Do you understand? So it wasn't no invasion or feeling disrespected when 4 a.m. came and she come opening the door. Buddy. Buddy. Christopher. When I'm asleep, I'm asleep, and I got the baddest attitude. Christopher, Christopher. So once you get out, yeah. son, we discussed that you were going to clean the kitchen. It's now 3.45 a.m., and my kitchen is still not clean. I need you to go do this now. Well, can I? No, because we tried to compromise. Earlier today, you didn't meet your side of the agreement. So now there's consequences. This is gentle parenting. Because never once does she have to beat me to get out the bed. Never once does she throw, traumatize me by pouring cold water on me to wake me up. Never once does she have to embarrass me to do all this stuff. She just simply reminded me of the verbal agreement that I made with her earlier that evening. So let's go through some things. One, gen uh, godly parenting is going to require training. It's going to require training. See, a lot of times we don't like gentle parenting because it requires work. See, it's easier to just whoop your butt. That's the easy thing. I mean, we could give the spiel. It's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. But at the end of the day, you did something I didn't like, and it's easy for me to take my belt off and whoop your butt. That's easy. The hard thing is coming to a compromise with a six-year-old. Have you had a test of patience? Try trying to compromise someone who doesn't have a full scope of the English language. Two. Before you get to point two, training also requires accountability. Yeah, it requires accountability. Because in Ephesians 6 and 1 said, children, obey your parents for this is right. So which means that you are holding your children accountable. And then in verse 4, it tells you what? Not to put, provoke them and do unto wrath, right? Accountability. Now, imagine if we flip this. God is telling us, children, obey your parents. When a pastor and apostle say, I need you to be here on the 27th for the walls of Jericho, they're holding you accountable. But then you want to fuss and fight. They're not going to provoke you now, so they're going to leave you up to what? God's hands. And like Pastor always has told, told the story, once I gave my children over to God, I no longer felt the stress. Because now she says, I'm going to hold you accountable to do what I've taught you to do, and I'm going to trust that God is going to lead you the rest of the way. So when we're training our children, we have to also train them to be accountable. Train them to understand that you have to be accountable to someone. I know that pastor has always told you, Pastor Chris, you can't be your own moral compass. Someone has to be holding you accountable. And I believe she's told a lot of you all that. When we train in godly parenting, training also comes with accountability. When you also look at training, you begin to look at the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. If you're training your child the right way, they could go. Yeah. They could go as far as they need to. But when he had his day of reckoning, when he was eating the pig slop, yeah. Yeah. and he realized that what he had and that his father's house was a lot better than where he was at, yeah. and he came back home mm -hmm. because he was raised right. See, we have to understand when we train our child, it don't matter how far to the left they go. I raised you. I did my part. I did my part. Because training isn't just a one-stop, here you go, boom, and I done gave you the manual. No. Training is repetitious. 
Training is constant. I could often call Dr. Sean Wonder Woman because I, she's one of the only mothers that I've seen who would get up in the morning, Sonia, go to work. After she got off work, go to school. Wait, go to work, pick me up sometimes, take, go to school with me, with her. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm gonna, no, you got to come because I'm about to be late, so come on. Take me to school with her, come back home, cook dinner, and then put us in bed, help us with our homework, and also make sure that she still got to type away her homework. You know, that, and she had two children, and neither one of us felt, well, mom likes her more. Mom likes him more. No, she did her equal justice. We both got tucked in at night. We both got read a book. That's just what it was. And a lot of times we think we're so overwhelmed that we're out here trying to do this. I got to go to work. I got to do this. I got to do this. And the Bible, it tells us to seek first the kingdom of God. A lot of times the issues we have is because we're not seeking God, even in our parenting. That if you were to seek first the kingdom of God, he says that you will have a godly heritage. I'll take care of you if your ways please me. What, gentle, uh, what godly parent is? It's two. It's not provoking. What does provocation look like? We be, I see this trend on TikTok where parents locking their kids in the bathroom with a filter. And they're, that's, to me, that's not funny. I don't think that's funny for children to experience a level of fear. Because the thing is, with parents, you're supposed to be the safe haven. If I don't feel that I have nowhere else to go, I knew I could tell Dr. Shine. Even when I was out in my mess and my sin, I had to change some things in the story around. But the place that I went to, Nikki, was my mom. Because the thing is, is when I go to her, I don't have to worry about uh, any of the other stuff. When it was my stuff, me and my teachers, I never had to worry about her saying, well, what did you do? That came later. But first, when I said, Mom, I'm being picked on, what happened? Well, I'm experiencing this, 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 and this. Well, are you doing your homework? Yes. Well, wait, I don't even got to ask. Yes, I know you're doing your homework because we done been around this mulberry bush too many times. Show me that you turned your work in. Where's your grade at work? Well, it's here. It's here. So now she's able to defend me. She ain't over here, my child, my child, and I'm making her look like a fool. She was my safe place. She defended me every time. Every, I could have been wrong. Uh, uh, Asia, I done called my teacher a drag queen and didn't care. I didn't care. I knew I was wrong. I still didn't care. And she had to come down to that school, and she had to hold her head up, well, Christopher did. Do, 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 do. Christopher, is this what happened? Well, how the story started was she she knew how to allow me to utilize this voice that I had. It's not provoking. She never once said, "Shut your mouth." No. Why would she begin to diminish this thing that God has given me that I'm so proficient at? I tell y'all, and I'm not being funny, this mouth didn't just come overnight. I have videos of us being in Hawaii, Nikki, at me, three years old. But mom, I'm picking up a dead bird that don't fell out the, uh, out the bush. But mommy, we have to take the bird back to its mommy because it needs the love. I'm three. Having a full comprehensive sentence about why this bird needs to be returned back to its parent. Deacon and Shalanda, am I telling the truth? Taylor would be saying stuff at six years old. I'd be her parent. Well, we have to go. Well, we have to go through the, this mouth has never not been a factor. But instead of her saying, you talk too much, you fast and cut your gift off, she embraced it. And the moment that it was disciplined, she had to, hey, 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 hey mother, mother, mother. I understand that Christopher was a, a bit far off, but I don't discipline him that way. And I would ask that you not do the same. She defended me. She was my safe place because I never felt provoked. I never felt that she was trying to, gotcha. Gotcha. I never felt like that. And even up until 
in my 20s when I just had a thing when I said, Mom, can you do me like this, please? I'm 27. Asking her for a change at 27. But when I was younger, I ain't had no problem. Thank you, Mom. Thank you for loving me because she didn't provoke. And as you're talking, Pastor Chris, when we think of not provoking our children, I think parents have to understand that there are three key things that they need to pour into their children to not provoke them. And the three things is you need to pour in a sense of worth. When we're not provoking our children, we're pouring into them a sense of worth. Psalms 139 and 13 says, For you formed my innermost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. That's in the Amplified. King James says it this way. Um, For thou hast possessed my reins, that thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. He says, before, I, before, I, before your mother knew you, I made you in your mother's womb. I knew you. I created you there. And parents, we have to understand, if we don't pour in a sense of worth into our children, when they go out into the world, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, they're going to catch it. They're going to catch it. Pastor had always, as we're growing up, she's always taught us, you're beautiful. You're handsome. You come from a royal lineage. There's no need to settle. There's no need, anything in the house you want, you can have it. But when people are telling their children, you need to ask me before you open up the cabinets. I used to work in group homes, and I would see that there were a lot of our girls who would get food, and then they would hide it in their rooms. So when it comes time to do room checks, I'm uncovering all types of snacks that's been hoarded for weeks on end. We didn't run out of fruit snacks weeks ago. How you still got fruit snacks? Because they were hoarding, they weren't taught a sense of worth. But which also goes into my next one, which is a sense of belonging. They didn't feel like they belonged. They didn't feel like they had anyone to hold them and make them feel like they were worthy of something. So, and it tells us in Psalms 68 and 6, I told, we are Bible teaching church. Our pastor always tells us that. And I just, I'm giving you these scriptures so when you're doing your parentingly duties, your children don't feel left out. They don't feel like they're put to the side. Psalm 68 and 6 in the NLT says, God places the lonely in families. When you feel like you belong, you don't feel like you're lonely. When you feel like you're a part of a well-knit family, you no longer feel like isolated loner. That's why we say here at Showers, we're a, a family. We're a family. We're not a church. We're a family because we want you to feel like you're a part of something. So when people come and they're coming by themselves and they have no family, we here are now your family. We're going to hold you accountable. We're going to make sure that we're keeping you um, held to the fire. We're going to make sure that we're covering you because we're a family. Thank you for tuning in to the Be Blessed broadcast. We pray that you are blessed by the message. If you were, please like, share, comment, and definitely subscribe. Or if you would like to order this message in its entirety, please go to our website at www.sbfaithcity.org and there you can sign up to partner with us for the Gathering of the Eagles where you receive all the messages in their entirety for Wednesday and Sunday. I promise you won't be disappointed. But remember, here at Showers of Blessings, we want you to be blessed.